Uh, okay, firstly, uh, before we begin the proceeding, I would like to acknowledge and pay respect to the traditional owners of the land in which we meet, the Gadigal people of the Aurora Nation. It's upon their ancestral lands that the University of Technology in this aerial conference is built. Thank you very much for coming to this, the first Australian Cluster Conference. Uh, it was a little more apprehensive when we started, but we got a really good ride and we had, a, I think, an enjoyable evening last night for dinner. Um, the conference has been organised by TCI Oceania in conjunction with RDA Australia Brisbane. Uh, the main reason for that is that TCI is an international organisation that doesn't have an institution in Australia, so we have to use someone else to organise the conference, and we have collaborated very well with RDA Brisbane. I'd like to take this opportunity of thanking them for their assistance and their work. Um, and As I suggested in the email to you previously that this is being recorded and all the presentations will be put on the TCI Oceania website tonight. As well, there has been a press release, which I'll send to all of you at some stage of the day when I can get access to my computer and uh, use it properly. Okay, we are going to start with a presentation from Christian Patel, so we're a welcome. He is the president of TCI and a Harvard academic. And then we will proceed with the four folk Williams who will make his first, the first presentation. In that context, that uh, the discussion of today can give a lot of uh, interesting uh, perspectives uh, as you uh, as you move forward. I'm very glad to to see that on your program you also have some of your colleagues uh, from New Zealand, Tony Kage, who was a, a, a great host of the TCI conference in Auckland. So Tony, uh, thank you for coming. Uh, and uh, engaging with, uh, with your Australian colleagues uh, on this issue. What I wanted to do uh, to kick it off the day is really quickly talk about two things. One is, uh, you know, really remind ourselves why is it that we talk about clusters? You know, some, sometimes people feel that all oh, of these guys that, that have an interest in clusters is like a church. You know, they think it's uh, 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 every, for everything, a cluster is a solution. Um, and that's certainly not the way that we feel. I think we're very focused in our work and our network uh, on uh, what can we do to enhance the prosperity of our location? What can we do to strengthen the way that uh, uh, the, the, the surroundings in which companies can compete globally? Uh, and then it just turns out that clusters is one of those perspectives that seem to give us a, a very interesting perspective on this issue. So I'll talk a little bit about that and hopefully that will connect to some of the later presentations that you have on the program. But then I also want to take the opportunity to talk quickly about TCI, who we are, uh, what we do, and uh, maybe also what benefits engaging in a global network uh, uh, like this can have to you in Australia. So let's uh, run, uh, jump right in. So when we think about you know, why is clusters an important perspective, it really has to do with, a, with an, an understanding, uh, an analytical part. Uh, it helps us to get a better handle on how do we deal with the complexity of looking at industries, at firm performance, at the role of locations, and so on. But ultimately also because we really do see the clusters as a, as a diagnostic perspective and as a way to organize our actions can have an impact, can have an impact on firms, and it can, it can have an impact on the effectiveness of government uh, policy. When we do talk about clusters, it's really these regional concentrations of economic activity in related industries. So it's not just narrow specialization in one type of activity, but it really tries to capture the idea that there are often many industries that are interacting in value chains uh, and in, in innovation processes, and that is what clusters are capturing. Um, now let's look at the understanding of economies part. What does this really mean? Well, first of all, uh, the clusters help us to see, you know, how does look how does location affect competition in your industry? Turns out that there are some parts uh, of, of the economy that are really not that exposed to global competition. Those are the activities that basically are spread out across the world uh, and, and, and across your nation. They compete with other firms in the same environment, and that can be very intense. Of course, the business environment still matters. Uh, but then we have the other part of the economy where companies do choose locations or whether a few locations really serve global and uh, national markets in those industries. So clusters as an analytical device can help us understand a little bit 
what does competition look like in my industry, in my sector, in those parts of the economy that you might be working with as an economic development profession? It helps us to see where our linkage is, what are the industries that we really have to look at together. This is something, something that uh, traditional industrial associations often miss. They look very narrowly. We're trying to look with clusters really conceptually at what are the networks of suppliers and related industries that have to come together in order to have an impact um, on economic performance. Clusters help you to understand how your region is specialized. What are we really good at? What are the areas in which we have a shot where we can give it a try, even if we're not strong yet? Or what we might have related industries and clusters that can kind of give us a beach camp into new areas rather than trying things that you know, look interesting on paper, but where our region really doesn't have anything we need uh, uh, to offer. Finally, the cluster perspective and cluster data is also very important to figure out who should I partner with. Now, in the old days, it was easy because, you know, basically the number of partners was limited, you know, with regions in the OECD and so on. Now, the global market is open. There are many countries, there are different profiles. Uh, that you could potentially reach out to, but who is it that's important? And I think there again, clusters can help you figure out what are the hot spots in our industry that really matter. Now, ultimately, you know, it's really about what are the benefits to firms. Um, and here, I think, you know, we see that that uh, a cluster perspective can help firms in a number of ways. Um, firms actually do benefit from the presence of clusters, although many firms are totally agnostic about whether or not there is a cluster around them. What they do understand, however, is is there a local labor market that they can tap into? Do they find the right people? That actually tends to be much easier uh, uh, in a cluster. They do know, you know, are we in a location where new ideas for our industry are born? Is this really a hotspot? Um, and again, that's basically the indication that there is a cluster in which they operate. Now, some firms do more, they really engage, others do not, and just get the passive benefits of uh, our cluster. And how can, how can firms more actively use cluster data? Well, first of all, they can try to figure out where are markets. Because it turns out, clusters are also markets. You know, this is where production happens. If you're a supplier, if you're providing a unique service, um, this is where you want to engage. You want to understand what are the other local special, uh, regional specialization patterns, the hotspots, with which you want to engage with. Second is, of course, if you're looking for a new site, um, you know, when do I want to have this production site? Where should I put my R&D activity? What is it that I can do? Well, I think firms are well advised to look at clusters and, try, and that way get information about where is dynamism, where are the right business environment conditions, what can I do as I move forward? But also, quite frankly, if you want to look at competitor analysis, it's a good idea not just to look at these other firms, but try to understand what are the locations in which they're operating, because that gives them access to a unique set kind of vocational advantage and assets. And so you can position yourself in a much better way to understand uh, what is our relative position, location versus location. And finally, firms are increasingly relying on partners. We kind of see specialization on, 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 on uh, uh, distinct advantages, distinct niches, distinct niches in the value chain that companies nowadays work on. Uh, here, cluster data, the understanding of clusters can help you to understand who are the partners, who should I reach out to, what are the locations that are most important if I want to make myself kind of uh, uh, connected to the best places in the industry. So clusters can help us understand economies. Clusters can help us as companies get an angle on what we can do. Well, ultimately, the cluster performance is then something uh, uh, the impact on, on, on firms is something that translates into benefits for the entire regional economy. And that is, of course, very important for economic development professions, professionals. They want to serve companies, but they have in mind ultimately what are the benefits to our region. Uh, now, here there's lots of economic data now. You know, I've shown just something here uh, that really shows that cluster presence does lead to higher wages, it does lead to more innovation. It does strengthen the resilience to deal with economic shocks in terms of job creation uh, and employment. Uh, and we also see that, and these are the bars here that compete industry and cluster, if you have specialization in the AR industry, there are some benefits to the economies of scale and so on. But if you have a presence in a cluster, so this broader set of related industries, you'll do it much better. You get higher benefits from the situation that you have. 
But the third dimension on this slide shows that you can also compare clusters in weak business environments, so where you have not that many good skills, infrastructure isn't right there, and so on, versus clusters in strong business environments. What you see is that clusters is really not an alternative to any of these traditional strengths in the location. What it is, it kind of it gives you a boost. It enables you to take more advantage of the strengths that you're building in your business environment. So it should be part of a coordinated strategy, using clusters to get more benefits uh, and to build those business environment strengths rather than seeing clusters as some sort of an alternative uh, to working with all of those areas. Finally, then, what does that mean for cluster policy? We've learned really over the years that clusters do emerge naturally. So these specialization patterns and the impact on firms, uh, that's really a, a, a normal process in the market economy, whether or not government intervenes, uh, intervenes in, in, in any way, uh, this just happens. So we shouldn't really think about creating clusters, building uh, clusters. However, what we do see that in these regional specialization patterns, collaboration doesn't automatically happen. You, know, you can just be all there tapping to the same labor markets, but not necessarily work together in sales or R&D or anything like that. Uh, and the upgrading of the cluster-specific business environment, let's say setting up a specific uh, uh, technology course or testing facilities or so on, that also requires collective action. And this is exactly why cluster initiatives are important. They provide a platform that allows firms to do together, often with government, things that they couldn't do alone or at least couldn't do as well. Clusters pool knowledge and information from these six, uh, different sectors, public and private, academia and so on, and really help you to do jointly what otherwise is just uh, not enough or not as efficient. Government then, you know, can use cluster data based on this understanding in a number of ways. It can support collaboration directly, you know, the point that I just made. It doesn't happen right away. Uh, a joint action, understand it's better. I understand, especially in Australia, that's an issue. Your government can play a role in trying to create the institutional fabric that supports uh, collaboration among firms, among firms and academia. Government can also focus and can say, okay, you know, we can't do the same for everyone. This is just not going to have any impact. We need to create critical mass also in the way that we use our tools. And so, you know, let's use the money that we're already used for economic development, but focus is much more uh, by working with clusters, with cluster organization to really create higher impact on the spending that we're, that we're getting. Finally, uh, for the selection of where to fund, where to invest the public money, uh, cluster data is quite important because we know that uh, if there's critical mass, you get benefits. If there's no critical mass, setting up a cluster organization and making it back with public money actually doesn't generate significant returns. We also have a on that. So this is where we now about kind of why clusters matter. Uh, what have we learned about the impact of cluster organizations then? What drives their success? What are the critical success factors? First of all, you know, you need to have a policy environment focused on overall competitiveness uh, that, that works and you need a strong cluster. You need to have critical mass to really move, make that move forward. But if you don't, uh, it is much more difficult, it still can be done, uh, but you're looking at a different type of uh, environment, different types of tools. So you have to focus on clusters as a way to strengthen your strength rather than to create something entirely new. But that's not enough. And I think here we've learned a lot over the years that both organizations, you know, how a cluster initiative is set up and what it does, the activities uh, are very important. We've learned about the importance of cluster initiative managers. We've learned about the importance of having the private sector drive the agenda rather than government trying to figure out, you know, now we would like you to do export, or we would like you to focus on R&D, all good things but it should be driven by a private sector who understands what the critical issues are in terms of market success. And we have the activities, and I think here again, it's very important to take a, 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 an inclusive view and really say, okay, let's take a step back here. What is it that's critical for our cluster to raise its overall performance? And then the answer sometimes might be we need to network. Sometimes it might be we need to earn nationalize more. We need to get our brand out. Sometimes it will be about workforce skill development. Sometimes it will be about R&D or specific infrastructure. The danger is that we start with this with an activity and then think that's enough. And that leads to efforts that are often very narrow. 
Uh, the second, second issue, and we should forget about that, is you know, we need to be good at what we are doing, you know, whatever we decide to do. Operational effectiveness uh, is very important, and one needs to kind of invest resources into that. This is exactly kind of the role that PCI plays nowadays. We want to help cluster practitioners globally uh, to really understand how they can up their play, how they can become better as an organization, and how they can become better in specific activities uh, uh, that they, uh, that they uh, engage in as a cluster organization. We're going to talk a little bit more about what, uh, what TCI is, and you know, I'm, I'm sure Richard and Tracy and others uh, can then go in and hopefully discuss a little bit more the reality of our network uh, with you as we go along. So who are we? Uh, we're the lead global network of professionals and organizations in cluster based economic development. So we're truly global. Uh, and this is not just you know, the reason that I'm here um, uh, uh, from the other side of the world, from Northern Europe. We have partners. Uh, across Asia, very strong in Europe, very strong in Latin America, based in Africa, North America, both in the US uh, and Canada. We have conferences that have moved around and mentioned now all of them. Uh, this year we're going to go to Mexico, last year we were in Denmark. Um, we are global, we are practitioner oriented. So this is not just about academic research, although I happen to be a researcher, but it's trying to understand what really makes things better in practice. Uh, and this is where I think you see uh, the value of practitioners network. We all focus on cluster-based economic development as, as a certain perspective, uh, but all of our members have the bigger picture in mind. They choose cluster-based economic development because they see this as an effective and efficient tool to achieve what they want to do for their companies and their leaders. What do we do? Well, we support cluster-based economic development by enabling collaboration between our members and between other organizations. We share a lot of knowledge through our website, through our conferences, uh, through other instruments, and social media challenges, through our databases. Uh, and we're trying to create knowledge. Well, that is not our focus. We are a platform that now enables people to come together to really tackle an issue like impact assessment. Uh, and that's really leads to what's in it. What are the other things? Uh, that you can access and, and, and draw on if you're a member of the TCI network. But first of all, you get a lot of up-to-date information from the globe of cluster practitioners. Uh, they're always inspiring stories, new ideas, new approaches to deal with uh, you, you get a review speech for the TCI conference, so there's a desired monetary benefit for you. Um, but then, you know, there are a lot of the more softer benefits. Uh, you get high-quality contacts uh, to individuals and organizations around the world. Uh, a lot of cluster-based organizations, regional, national, uh, very strong connections that we have to international organizations like uh, the World Bank, uh, the American Development, the European Commission, the OECD, CAP, uh, the Asian Development Bank, you need the one and so on. You can be listed and access our databases on clusters, on cluster programs, something that we're just setting up, and on experts. Uh, so if you're looking for somebody or you want to be interested in the project, this is how you can do it. You can participate in member-specific activities. We have setting up a mentoring uh, uh, network uh, where younger professionals can kind of get in contact uh, with uh, more seasoned practitioners to learn from them and, and ask questions and so on. We started to do peer reviews so the organization can get
excellent uh, lineup of, of, of speakers. We're going to look at, as you see here, on uh, shared values and combining the social agenda with the economic agenda um, of, uh, of cluster. We're going to look at Mexico, what's going on with very dynamic, uh, interesting economy. And we're going to look at the reindustrialization of North America. A lot of people talk about that uh, activity shifting out of China. Uh, into Mexico and the U.S., uh, what's, what's the background to decide what can be done? Uh, so I think a lot of interesting uh, topics, in addition to our normal program um, of activities around making cluster-based economic development better and share our knowledge on that. So let me stop here. Uh, I wish you a great day. Uh, a lot of interesting discussions, hopefully, and I'm looking forward to learning from Richard and Tracy uh, about what has been done, uh, what has been achieved during that day, and uh, who knows. Uh, ideally, I would like to welcome uh, many of you personally when we are in Norway. Thank you very much, and uh, goodbye from Stockholm. As Christian says, the next conference is in Monterey in November, and the following year, in 2015, it's in Daegu, the home of Samsung in Korea in November 2015. So if you want to find out any further information, see Tracy and I at some stage during the day. And uh, thank you very much for listening to Christian's opening speech. Um, I'd now like to introduce uh, one of the founders of TCI, Evo Folk Williams from New Zealand. Uh, he is the CEO of Clusters Navigators. He has vast experience in clustering and clustering training in many countries across the globe. In fact, when you ring him, the first question you ask is, where are you? <laughs> it's like, where in the world is Carmen Urana? We used to ask when kids played his original video games. So I would like to ask Evo to come forward, and he's working on a different platform, which is an Apple. Good morning, everybody. Richard, thank you for that kind welcome. Richard, let me acknowledge, too, as you were doing, I'd like to acknowledge Tracy, who for the first time in Australia brought together the TCI, TCI members from around the world for the conference in 2002. Good on you, Tracy. I'd also like to acknowledge Tony Coey, who took the lead in bringing people to Auckland, New Zealand, two years ago for the TCI Global Conference. And as Christian Kettles was mentioning, the next one coming up in Mexico, second week in November. I want to share with you some of my experiences from around the world. I'm going to particularly share with you what I see going on in Europe at the moment, and an extension almost of what is going on in Europe to what is happening right now in some small Pacific islands with EU funding. And then I want to, as I finish, contrast that with what I see happening down under in Australia and in New Zealand. So that, that's my game plan. Let me emphasize, as I start, Christian Kettles and Christian Kettles with a neat reflection here. The evidence today is clear. Regions that are home to dynamic clusters and companies that are rooted in those clusters, that are grounded in them, companies that obtain sustenance from those clusters, quite simply do better. 20 years, 25 years ago, when Porter came out with the competitive advantage of nations, with work that was based very much on Mike Enright's research around the world, we didn't have the hard data that Christian and others are able to draw on today. It was more a finger in the air. It feels right that related companies, successful companies, happen to be clustered in different parts of Italy, different parts of the US, different parts of Sweden. But the, the empirical data is now in place. Partly, as a result of that, as I look at the EU, every single EU country today has got some form of cluster support program in place. Every single one, without exception. Sometimes at the national level, sometimes at the equivalent of a, of a, of a state level. 
every country. Sometimes it's coming from a technology agency, sometimes it's coming from a regional economic development agency. Every country has got some type of support in place. I was in Brussels last week. The buzzword in Brussels is smart specialization. Christian used it a couple of times. To me, it's a, it's a neat word, because in part, it is saying we need to work through what are we already good at doing, rather than dreaming about what we haven't got. What, is, what are our smart specializations? And the concept of a smart specialization often extending beyond clusters. Clusters are the mechanism to engage, but a smart specialization could be, for example, a platform capability that reaches across, that underpins a number of the clusters within the region. The focus from Brussels today is very much encouraging each region across Europe, each region work through what are you already good at doing? What are you already shining at? And then understanding how you crank that up, how you move that forward. And we see, for example, in France, a wide range of clustering initiatives, some with national support, opposed to competitive, again, each region working through what are we good at doing, what are our strengths? Because it's no longer a little bit of everything. What really are our core capabilities in the region? We see in Germany, each region coming through. And I'm envious as a Kiwi of the type of support that the Germans are offering. <coughs> but I offer this slide in part to make the point that this is the competition we're up against. This is how other places are organizing themselves. And importantly, in Germany and France and these other places, it's not somebody in the capital city deciding what is the application of these funds. But rather, it is those within the region, within the cluster, working through. What is the best application? Is it building an incubator? Is it export development? Is it investment attraction? Is it developing a regional brand? Is it vocational training? It is up to each cluster to work through its own strategic agenda with generous funds coming often from state, from national, or even from the EU. I spent quite a bit of time in Sweden. I was there at the end of last week. I want to drill down a little bit in Sweden and use this as an example. And using it as an example to share with you, this is what other places are doing. This is how other places are organizing themselves now when it comes to economic development. So I want to share with you a little bit of Sweden's national cluster program. I have two exhibits. There will be a copy of this available for each person with the help of Blue Mountains Economic Development. Thank you, Jacqueline and team. We have just photocopied it. And encourage you to pick up a copy because this again is evidence of what other countries are doing. It's how they're organizing themselves. Let me just share with you a little bit of what Sweden is doing. They've gone out with a national competition. Some 200 proposals have come in. Only 15 of those have been funded, but funded very generously. Around a million euros a year, each year for 10 years with that million euros needing to be at least matched. But the budget of many of these clustering initiatives in Sweden is around two, three million euros a year, and it's locked in for 10 years. Yes, there's some small prints that, that there are review processes, but it is essentially locked in place. It's encouraging each region in Sweden to identify what really are our strengths, what are we really good at doing. It's encouraging active collaboration across the triple helix. It's getting business, different levels of government, different academic institutions sitting around the same table together. It's not just funding that is being offered in Sweden. It is also a lot of process support, a lot of training of the cluster managers, training of the boards of these clustering initiatives, a lot of working with these frontline people to support them. About 
of the budget goes into this final aspect, the, 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 the support. I'll share with you three examples. This first example is called the biorefinery of the future. This is a Mount Gambia, sort of. It's a Mount Gambia in the sense of it's got an awful lot of timber. And the question in this corner in northern Sweden, as in Mount Gambia, is do we ship it out as a commodity or do we add value? And what this small community, the small or remote community, is doing is understanding down to a molecule what is the highest value application of each molecule. It's stripping the trees, stripping the timber, the lumber, down to its essence. And this is the team that's working on this. This is the triple helix team in action. On the left-hand side, a range of different companies, very specialized companies, they're co-located. The top right, four universities. Four universities that now have PhD students in this remote place. Ten years ago, when this initiative started, there was no university presence in this remote town at all. Four universities now doing specialist R&D, specialist support that relates to the competencies. And in the bottom right, in comes government, a range of different government agencies. Export Tradit, the Australian equivalent, different municipalities, different national government agencies. All able to row in the same boat together able to come together to work through what are the key things that we need to do to lift our performance. This is triple helix in action. Second example I want to take you to, it's tucked away in the south of Sweden, quite close to Copenhagen, a region called Skona, population one and a half million. Their first initiative under the national program related to a food cluster. And some of the political fathers in the region were skeptical at first, said, if there's money, let's give it a go. This is the region SCONA today. This is their economic development agenda. They've moved on from food to building clusters around mobile communications, risk security, packaging. This happens to be the home of Tetra Pak and freight logistics, life sciences. It's not just one cluster. It's a number of clusters under development, and particularly, they're looking at where do these clusters overlap? Where might a company draw on the competencies emerging from two, perhaps even three, clusters? They've also been very careful in working through what are the key international markets for each of these clusters. So they're building the local connections within their region, but also the global connections that are specific to each of their clusters. This is their economic development agenda for the region. The third example I want to share with you is way up north. This is where I was on Friday last week. It's a process IT cluster. This is my third visit there, and the first time I went there I said, hey, come on, guys, what are you doing up here? What's special about IT? And I said, don't listen to me, We've got a lot of cap capabilities here in mining. What we're developing is the IT for mining that doesn't need people down the mine, for remote mining. We've got a lot of pulp and paper mills. What we've got here is, pulp, is ICT for pulp and paper mill management systems. And this is the center today in the world for IT in those two specific areas. I was there for the day with a professor from America, an IT professor, to review where has this clustering initiative got to? And the question I was being asked by Benova, the national agency, this cluster has had its journey for 10 years. They've now made an application for six further years of funding. Do we proceed with that funding or do we call it a day? And if we're proceeding, is there some small print that we attach to that funding? Are there some conditions? So that, that was the question I was being asked and spent a day, um, this is the board of the initiative, spent a day with different groups of the cluster. 
some of the large corporates, some of the small businesses, the two universities that are engaged, the different public agencies in reviewing this clustering initiative and looking at where might it go to next. To give you a feel of who I was talking to in my second exhibit, I make copies of this. It's the agenda uh, for my day last Friday in this cluster, and it really gives you a feel of who are the different people, the different organizations that are involved. And what I see in these places in Sweden, what I see in many of these clusters in Europe, I have yet to see in Australia, I have yet to see in New Zealand. Taking a smaller community, Bornholm, an island, a Danish island, and the Baltic Sea, population just over 40,000. What's Bornholm doing? This is their economic development agenda. They've identified seven clusters, seven <coughs> core specializations within this small island. But then as they got to work with those seven, they realized that really they came together with three key themes. And this is the focus now on building Bornholm as the green, sustainable um, the pilot facility, building Bornholm as a food island, building Bornholm as an adventure island. Okay? The strategy for economic development here, as in many parts of Sweden, other parts of Europe, it is centered on the wealth-creating clusters. There's a lot of EU support today going into linking clusters across Europe. The argument from the EU in part is that individually these clusters don't have the critical mass to face Asian, to face North American competition. We need to bring them together, but also bring them together to develop business to business and academic to academic links. So a lot of cluster to cluster linking happening, whether it's food or whether it's plastics, bringing together folk to establish common agendas. But it's not just Across, the, across Europe, the EU is also supporting these clean tech clusters, supporting the engagement of clean tech, clean tech clusters around the world. And the difficulty for you in Australia, for us in New Zealand, we're not part of this at the moment. We haven't got the infrastructures in place. We haven't got the building blocks in place at a cluster level that enables us to effectively engage. I talked a little bit about what is happening in Europe. Let me take this a step further. With EU funding, I think I can say the first pilot program is now underway in four Pacific islands. It's the EU that has kick-started it. It's a relatively short-term intervention, just six months. It's been driven by the Chambers of Commerce. It's private sector driven, not government driven. Budget, a million euros. Just to give you a quick feel of what is going on. In Samoa, the focus is adding value to coconuts. Many of the coconuts just fall on the ground in Samoa. They're wasted. But there are people that are pressing valuable oil, other people making soap, making cosmetics. This is the group that came together for a first workshop. It was Triple Helix. It included New Zealand Aid. It included AusAid. It included the EU office. It included an academic institution. But mainly, it was farmers, business folk, coming together to explore for the first time. And might we work as a team to lift our competitiveness? The cluster in Vanuatu that has been chosen for the pilot is cruise tourism. There'll be a doubling in the number of cruise ships visiting Vanuatu next year. Vanuatu has yet to fully get the infrastructure in place to manage that, yet really to work through how do they extract value out of all those high-value tourists. In Little Tonga, it's different. And it is really Little Tonga. This is a country with a population of 100,000. And by the time the royal family, I don't know who's by the time the royal family has creamed off the major businesses, there isn't much left for the small guys. What is developing there is the Team Tonga approach, a branding in part, but helping individual firms link with, network with others to establish critical mass. In PNG, and the pilot that's 
came through that surprised me. It's ICT, which particularly relates to a lot of graduates of Australian universities that have returned to Port Moresby with skills in ICT, haven't been able to find a job, and are now busy creating their own job, creating their own businesses. So bringing these folk together to establish common agendas, and wow, this one has a buzz, and I'll be back with them in a couple of weeks' time. Make a few comments on the cluster manager. The cluster manager is the catalyst. This is a key role. This is a, ma a magic person. They're scarce. A few comments on this person, describing the person. Firstly, they're a change agent, disruptive. You need to be able to push through barriers, break conventional wisdom. I'm describing a superman, or perhaps a little more likely, a superwoman. Five pieces of advice to cluster managers. Number one, listen. Listen carefully to your stakeholders. Visit them, eyeball them, go to their premises. Identify from those discussions where might there be common agendas from the bottom up. Respond with demand-orientated services, collaborative projects. So number one, listen carefully. Two, explore at the cluster's periphery. Go to the edges. Go to the edges where new things are happening. People are testing new markets, new applications, new technologies. A vibrant cluster is not a static cluster. It's not the same old, same old. A vibrant cluster is continually exploring, continually pushing out. Test new gen agendas that are passion. Don't kill them through debate. Build a portfolio of activities, accepting that not everything will fly. A culture of learning by doing, rather than paralysis by analysis. If there aren't failures, then perhaps as the cluster manager, you're not pushing hard enough. If you're working at the periphery, there are bound to be failures. Three, find the cluster champions that others trust. As the cluster manager, you can't do this flying solo. You've got to engage with others, you've got to build a team. Find your talent. Find the people that you can empower. Build a coalition of the willing around you. A coalition that are willing to engage, willing to put in sweat equity to make new things happen. And please, ensure as the cluster manager, you're not the sucker with all the to-do lists. Ensure you're not the manager for everything. Rather, empower and trust others to take the lead, so you're freed up to act as the catalyst for other initiatives. <coughs> Four, build a cooperation culture. Build a culture where, yes, we compete, but also we collaborate. And sometimes I feel we go too far in expecting, encouraging collaboration all the way through. It's healthy to compete, but it is also very healthy to work through where might we leave her off each other. And encourage you as well as engaging at the umbrella level, cluster-wide initiatives. <coughs> You're helping small groups of firms come together, perhaps for co-purchasing, maybe co-marketing, developing a common brand. The concept of co-specialization and a successful cluster over time has companies that feel, you know, we don't need to do everything anymore. What we can now do is focus on what we do best. We can outsource, subcontract other things. And this, coast, this specialization is a key to productivity at a firm level as well as at a cluster level. So creating an environment that helps firms co-specialize, that helps in building the co-creation of value. And I will share with you as I finish an example of that from Australia. 
my final point. <laughs> Blow your trumpet. Make noise. You're a change agent. And to create change, you need to find different ways to reach people, to get inside heads. Use the media. Blow your trumpet widely within the cluster, but importantly, beyond the cluster too. I see some clustering initiatives that are more like secret societies. It's just a small, inward-looking club, rather than an outward club that is reaching out, making a lot of noise, and helping the world realize this is a hot spot. We've got something standing out. I started in Europe. I started in making the point that cluster development across Europe today is center stage when it comes to economic development. It's the framework that links together a lot of things, R&D, training, investment, migrant attraction, skills, incubators, industry precincts, export development, internationalization. It enables us particularly to work through what are the priorities, what is the agenda of each of the clusters that we're working with? As the Economist Intelligence Unit put it, there are few economic development policies as popular as clusters. Hard today to find a country, region, or even a city that isn't in some way engaged. Hold on. It's actually not that hard. Here's two of them that I'm highlighted. Australia, coming in as 37th in the Global Competitiveness Report on ranking cluster development. New Zealand coming in 73rd. When there's such a difference between Australia and New Zealand, I'm suspicious about the statistics, <laughs> suspicious of the, the, the fundamentals here. But clearly, the two of us don't rank that well. We're not doing that good. And it puzzles me. And my question, why is cluster development not as fully on the agenda here, both sides of the Tasman, as it is as we see in Europe, as Christine Kettles was describing it in the video? We've certainly had the intellectual grunt that has come, for example, of Mike Enright's work, both sides of the Tasman. <coughs> The foundations are here, but yet I just don't see the same understanding, particularly at the capital city level, as I see in Northern Europe, or in Europe as a whole. There are some exceptions. Some exceptions at a very regional level. Some exceptions, and I'll take you in a moment, to the Blue Mountains. Some exceptions in South Australia. Some exceptions in Northern Victoria. But those exceptions on an Australian scale are relatively small. And on the whole, it's cluster development on a shoestring, with relatively small budgets over a relatively short period of time. We just haven't got our act together, in the same way as I see our competitors. But there are some glimmers of hope. One of them is here, where I was on Wednesday, in the Blue Mountains, test you on this. Who's heard of Lottie? Three, four, five. I hadn't heard of Lottie either until Wednesday. I'd like to introduce Lottie to you. Kelly, would you come and help me? This is Kelly from the Blue Mountains Economic Development Agency. Kelly has been working with this creative cluster. Can you tell us a little story? Tell us how Lottie gets into it, please. So this is Lottie, um, direct from the UK. Um, we are a creative cluster, this creative cluster in the Blue Mountains. And one of our big hotspots that I, um, that I discovered was in film and animation. So we pulled everyone together to have a bit of a chinwag, a bit of a muster for everyone who was either in uh, working in film and animation or who wanted to. 60 people turned up on a rainy Saturday 
and um, very quickly the sparks started to fly. There was a woman there who was a media producer. Her daughter loved Lottie because Lottie is a very special doll. She's um, a girl um, instead of a woman. So she's not like Barbie, she doesn't have curves or makeup or jewelry. She stands on her own two feet. She does a lot of adventure activities like archaeology and um, karate. And she'd always wanted to develop some media around Lottie, but until we had this um, cluster muster, she didn't realise that she had all the local talent there, you know, within sort of a 10k radius. So at this muster, this producer met her director and an animator who could make Lottie come to life, um, and a scriptwriter and, and a, a score composer, and pulled all these people together. She made a um, cold pitch to the company in the UK. Um, they loved it. They came over to visit us, and now we have um, Grant from Economic Enterprise helping um, these two organisations create a joint venture so that um, Lottie will be on our TVs, hopefully, in the near future. Shirley, thank you for that story. But this is cluster development. I'm not belittling in any way what you're doing with Blue Mountains, but it is cluster development in a shoestring. The funding is in place to employ Kelly for just three days a week, and it's just Kelly. In Europe, for a similar cluster, there might be two or three people full-time, long-term employment. And what I see across Australia, across New Zealand, are just a few Kelly folk at a very regional level, who are making a difference. But we simply, so far, haven't got in place either side of the test, the institutional support, or even the understanding that a modern economy is not a little bit of everything. A modern economy is built up of strong regions, each of which have the smart specializations. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Eve, all, for a very insightful presentation. Uh, there's time for a couple of questions. Is anyone like to ask him a question? Thanks, uh, Mark Matthews and Ben's hands. I, I, I'd like to just to uh, you know, follow on a little bit as to why you think, perhaps, in the, in the niche as to why we haven't in this part of the world been able to leverage this, and what you think would be the key uh, points or the key touch points that government to get them to understand that they are lagging. Your question is a good one, and I don't have a clear answer, because I don't understand it. People from Canberra, people from Wellington, go to EU conferences, they go to conferences the equivalent of the TCI conferences around the world. They should be aware of what is happening, but somehow they're not able to pick it up, not able to relate it. Somewhat cynically, I think cluster development implies effective cluster development is empowering the regions, which therefore is disempowering central government, disempowering Canberra. What I see in places like France, there was describing a lot more autonomy. So even in a very centralized country like France, a lot more autonomy being given to those clustering initiatives to the regions. You work out the agenda, rather than us in the capital city trying to call the shots. Certainly I sense in Wellington, we've still got too many folk in the capital city who want to call the shots and feel they should, rather than being comfortable and empowering, be comfortable and letting go. But I don't think that's an adequate answer, because I'm, I'm struggling. That's a really good point, because that, that really, I think, the lies that is that we always try in our own regions to get alignment to the federal rather than drawing alignment from. Yeah. And would much prefer. what I see in Europe is bottom up economic development. It's not the old fashioned top down where we come up with a national IT strategy or a national biotech strategy. Because those strategies, on the whole, don't, the rubber doesn't hit the road, they're too remote. But rather, what I see is perhaps a series of regional biotech strategies, and then from that building up, what are the common agendas, what is the national. Place and to focus on that can be quite a challenge. 
and, and, and I'm pleased with the EU funding in the Pacific Islands. It's through the Chambers of Commerce rather than through, let's say, ministries. Because in the end, cluster development is about business for business, creating an environment for businesses. But a danger at times is that it's captured by the bureaucracy. And, 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 and what we see with the chambers in the islands too is much more comfortable of strategic doing rather than strategic planning. Much more comfortable in let's get on with it and learn by engagement rather than ooh, ooh, let's develop a five year plan before we do anything at all. Thank you. One more The national agency, Vinova, in Sweden, offers a million euros a year for 10 years to their winners. That has to be at least matched. And the matching comes sometimes from business groups, sometimes from local universities, sometimes from industry associations, different types of business groups. They're not too fussy on where the matching comes from, as long as there is at least matching. And in most cases, there is more than matching. So, so that for Sweden, they used their initial one million to kick the process, to start the process off. One of the, can I make this last point before I finish? One of the key learnings in Sweden is this. Only 15 of the 200 applications have been funded. So what's happened to the other 185? At least 50 of them had enough steam that they essentially said, well, stuff you, Stockholm, we're going to do it anyway. And that is in part what Vinova wanted to happen. And that really is where they're getting leverage, because what Vinova fundamentally wanted to do was not fund a number of clustering initiatives, but rather change the culture in Sweden and change the culture where each region works through what are we good at doing and how do we engage in a triple helix framework around that? How do we force businesses, local politicians, local academic institutions to sit at the same table? And where wow, have they succeeded? Thank you. Thank you very much, e One of the problems facing us all, particularly regional development agencies or uh, local business groups is the future of manufacturing. And I've got two people to talk on this. Zoran Angelkowski, who's the Managing Director of META, the Industry Association, and Barry McLaughlin from the, uh, in a, the Food Innovation Australia. So could uh, Zoran come on? So good morning, everyone. Today I'm going to talk to you about um, manufacturing in particular, but more about uh, what we're doing in terms of uh, clusters, and I was very interested in the first two presentations. Um, and Richard, uh, as Richard, he described uh, META as an industry association. Well, it's not an industry, but I will uh, try to articulate that through my presentation. So let me start off with my presentation um, by talking a little bit about how we see the future of advanced manufacturing. Um, we have many people talking about and continuing to describe a problem, and we have others that are part of the solution and fix the problem. And there's nothing wrong with this, but we should be doing less of describing what the problems are and more about fixing problems. And I'll come back to what META is all about. So, META is actually, uh, and I was glad to hear that uh, um, the uh, concept of the smart specialization, in actual fact, that's how META started. Uh, META is actually based on the EU report on smart specialization, 
and it's about creating collaboration between industry, university, um, and uh, the uh, private sector. It's this regional clustering approach. But uh, META is actually, and you see the, uh, I think on the bottom left hand side, it's supported by the Commonwealth Government. So this is part of the former uh, Labor federal government where they introduced industry innovation precincts. And they had the idea of having about 10 precincts. Um, just before the election, the food precinct and the manufacturing precinct, which I represent, and you'll hear from Barry, I think a little bit later, where he talks about the um, food precinct. And uh, the idea was to have 10 of these rolled out in various sectors, in oil and gas, mining services and equipment, and in that. Um, and really, they were to address three areas, which is practical collaboration, commercialized innovation, and business excellence. So, uh, manufacturing and food, uh, we uh, started on the 1st of July 2013, last year. Um, and then the election was called, and after three prime ministers, three industry ministers, we are still here. Um, there was uh, a change of government, as we all know, and at the moment we uh, have been working uh, to develop META. And META is really a collaborative network of high potential manufacturing uh, businesses and researchers. So it's a membership organization. But there's one thing, it's an industry-led, industry-taking responsibility organization. We do not charge a membership fee. We're supported by the federal government. We are funded by the government. That's the only connection we have with the federal government. They give us money to create a network of clusters, and I'll try to explain uh, what we mean. Um, the reason we did not say to manufacturing businesses, and here I'm talking specifically, and I know Barry will talk about food, but we're talking about manufacturing, and I'll uh, I'll explain to you the definition of advanced manufacturing because there is a lot of confusion of what people think advanced manufacturing is. They think it's robots and autom uh, automation. So manufacturing is really, uh, in this, in the sense of meta, is anyone that makes a widget, is planning to make a widget, or has made a widget and offshore it, in very simple terms. And researchers includes all of the universities and public funded research organizations. So META at the moment, we have, I have seen in the last year, 450 uh, SMEs around Australia, all manufacturers. And if anyone tells you there's a problem in manufacturing in Australia, stop reading the newspapers and you'll know that there isn't a problem. I have personally seen fantastic companies here who are excellent in what they do. Um, and unfortunately, this is not so. META is really aiming at the SME organization, these, these companies which are the backbone of any advanced economy. You see that in Germany. Um, I've spent 30 years in the uh, auto industry and I've worked half of my time in, uh, uh, in Europe and Asia. And I know the Mittelstand uh, section very well in Germany and how that uh, operates. So it's about, um, META's about creating a framework of these businesses and researchers coming together and collaborating and coming up with good ideas and ultimately the success is two things it's growing your business and achieving a high level of customer satisfaction anyone that comes from a business here if you're not doing these two things you cannot innovate you cannot collaborate you're not you're continually cost-cutting, but you're never looking at your top line. And the aim of uh, META is really through a leadership mindset to accelerate the growth through collaboration and commercialized innovation. And when we talk about leadership, there are good leaders in the world and bad leaders. And META's not here to change the mindset of leaders, but what we look for, and these companies that we've seen are over 450, is a leadership mindset there are three or four things that come out. It's one of a can-do attitude, challenging the status quo, seeing a future, and collaborating at a local and global level. And we have these companies here in Australia, believe it or not. And they don't look at Canberra to tell them what to do next. For them, they service their customers, they find their global niche, and they operate on a global level. 
The challenges of manufacturing, it's globalization, the world of globalia. It's a global game and there is no level playing field. If anyone tells you that there's a level playing field, the global war of competition, particularly manufacturing, it doesn't exist. It's a figment of everyone's imagination. So it's maybe I'm sort of having a bit of a go at the, on the left hand side, but there isn't. Every country, every region in the world does something to look at how they can create the right framework for their particular industry. And single companies versus collaboration networks. Collaboration always wins out in the end. If we, if we take the single company approach, we will never succeed, particularly in advanced manufacturing. So, what do I mean by advanced manufacturing? I said before, it's not about robots and automation. Advanced manufacturing is this value chain from supplier to customer and everything in between its technology, its processes, <laughs> skills along the whole value chain, including the customer, including the supplier, including the services around. So when people talk about a factory has closed down and failed, they're only talking about one aspect, which is manufacturing. But the excellent companies do well at every bit of that value chain. They are good at R&D, they're good at sales and marketing. Uh, that they uh, service their customer and give them a little bit more. So they are customer focused, supplier focused, and that's what uh, um, um, advanced manufacturing means, and it's to be done in a reliable, sustainable way, better than any other global competitor. And the future of advanced manufacturing, you all know mass production, you know, uh, 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 commodities, the future will be in three areas. Mass customization, make exactly what your customer wants and make one of them, and not a hundred and say take them. It's the old example of the black team of a Ford. You know, uh, we make it and you take what, whatever it is. It's about sustainability, and it's not about sustainability, not in the sense of hugging the tree, but it's about sustainability across your whole supply chain. Where do you get that part made? How, Reliable is it? What sort of checks and regulations you have? And the third one is speed, speed to market. Uh, interesting when the Canadians, and uh, Canada is at the moment in terms of global competitiveness in manufacturing, they come second after Mexico. And the reason is <coughs> they, they looked at ways of how they can be competitive. And they said, how can we beat the Americans at manufacturing? They're pretty good at it. The one area where they can beat them was at speed. So they narrowed everything down, speed to market. And that's why they're globally competitive, even some of the Canadian cities. The UK, at the moment, they're going up the ladder in terms of in, in manufacturing becoming more globally competitive than the, than the top countries, even Germany and the US. So I always say in one of my speeches, if the, if the uh, uh, people in Britain can do it, Australia can do it also. I just wanted to tell you about uh, the, the three areas, mass customization, what do I mean by that? And one of the things about smart specialization, and I, and I heard um, E4 talk about, was uh, what are you good at? That's what smart specialization is about. In this particular company, it's an Australian company, Australian turntable company, they are good at making turntables, and they make it for restaurants. If you go to Shanghai, that's a turntable. But mass customization for them means uh, this particular company, if, if their core capability is in turntables, they can then service the mining industry in turntable. And that's about transforming. Everyone talks about uh, coming from the auto sector. They should diversify. They should do something else in defense or aerospace. But it's really talking about what is your smart, what is your core capability, and then using that and not worrying about what industry you play in. And that's uh, this particular Australian company. They go from restaurants to the mining uh, sector. Yeah. Sustainability. I talked about sustainability, not the, uh, the green stuff, but uh, sustainability is your value chain. How much value do you place, for example, on eggs produced here, which is cage tents, as opposed to free range. We know if you go to a supermarket, if it's caged eggs, you pay two dollars. If it's uh, free range, you pay double, triple the price. Why is it? Why are consumers? So it's about understanding the sustainability of the supply chain. And speed to market. 
very uh, prominent in the fashion industry because they, this is a company also uh, in Australia, they were talking about 12 months production of certain suits and dresses and now they do what they did in 12 months, they do it in two weeks, sell more and have less waste. So it's about speed, it's about satisfying the customer. Um, one of the things when we uh, started the journey of Meta uh, and uh, is trying to find out what are the, uh, the ingredients of successful companies. And there's a study, it's a uh, German Simon Kuchen Partners, over a 20 year period they studied around about 2,700 uh, 2, companies and they said, what makes these companies successful? What are the ingredients of success? And there are seven, it's, a, it's an excellent study, and uh, I mean, the only reason uh, I chose it is because it's the only study you can get over a 20 year period. There are seven attributes of these successful companies, and that is one, they set themselves very ambitious targets. They want to operate in the top five global market space. They, uh, their, their focus is really on know-how and doing things themselves and thinking twice before they outsource anything. So they're very vertically integrated. They are global in terms of servicing their customers. Uh, they find their global niches. They don't worry about their local competition. They spend innovative. They spend two or three times more on R and D than any other company. They are very close to the customer. More than 25% of their employees engage on a daily basis talking to their customer, and not uh, delegating this responsibility to an agency. Um, they, the employees, are, um, their retention rate is all 50% lower than the top 20 OECD countries. They retain their staff, they're loyal. Their top management has been there more than 10 years. And their, their um, um, uh, understanding of what is leadership or management, <coughs> nothing more than common sense. So these are the seven attributes. And when you look at this, uh, what in, in, in meta, what we're trying to do by, by creating this collaborative network is really between industry, manufacturing <coughs> companies and universities, and we have approximately 300 members in a short period of time. As I said, we don't charge membership fee. We say to them, no, you give your leadership time because it's industry net. You participate, and I'll tell you what the engagement model is, but for us it was also very important to see what are the successful companies in Australia, and we call them the hidden champions, the Meta 500. Finding, uh, in Austra Australia has about 90,000 manufacturing companies, if you take away ones and twos, mums and dads, it's about 50,000. If you look at those that are good across the value chain, more than 25, uh, there's about 7,000 really operate across the value chain. And the successful ones we call the Meta 500, we want, to, and so far we've seen 450, there's probably about 80 of them that fit the criteria of hidden champions. Uh, really global, all exporting, with that right leadership mindset. And the reason we want to identify these companies, not only to give them a voice, but to demonstrate already what's possible, so that the others can say, if they can do it, I can do it also. And that's our focus here on the 500 companies across industry. So META is a national organization, it's across industry. It's about collaboration across the entire value chain. Um, the whole thing about the bottom-up approach. So we have a data, uh, when we started this journey back in February, we asked uh, the Department of Industry, give us data on manufacturing. Doesn't exist. So we built up a database of nearly four and a half thousand manufacturing companies, but not just the name, address, and product portfolio. We're talking about a capability index level one to level four, really what they're good at. And the reason you need this capability mapping of industry and you need the capability mapping of universities, because I'll just say something about universities. Collaboration is industry and universities coming together, innovating, collaborating, and it's not uh, today, we have fantastic universities in Australia, but they focus on education, research papers, fundamental research. But there's an element of universities that we call applied research. What are the needs of industry? How can we help industry through collaboration to come up with good ideas and innovations? And that's 
what we call the university capability mapping and what MIT is doing at the moment. Um, I'm not sure who the is. Are you in the room? Somewhere? No, he's not uh, but we are looking at about 20 of the 40 universities and actually engaging with them and saying what are the good ideas or good inventions that, we can, that you have that we can commercialize much, much quicker. But it's really about the networks we're creating, and I'll talk about this. So we have all of these companies in, around Australia, and I heard the difference between Australia and New Zealand, and I have a... I have a I can say something there. There's a difference between Australia and New Zealand. Australia has seven countries, New Zealand is one country. It's already an advantage. If you look at what we have in Australia, and I've spent half of my uh, time, as I said, in Europe and Asia, I have never seen so many industry association bodies, and you only need two people to have a meeting and they form an association. Um, I am astounded. I think uh, the US probably has more. So it's not a question of uh, how many uh, associations we have, but there's so much help there uh, that somehow, uh, particularly the SMEs are confused. But when we look at Australia, uh, and we're talking about clusters here, how can we really connect and create this platform of collaboration and innovation. And that's through four levels. We have admitted there's two ways of engaging. One is a collaboration hub, an area of interest, the subject. And what we do here is get industry, get uh, universities across the industry nationally, collaborate, area of interest, subject, additive manufacturing, uh, design, lead innovation, uh, we have, uh, I think there will be a presentation, the sports technology hub. Another way of engaging is a project, but a project is not what the CRC is doing over a long period of fundamental research. It's about, you know, uh, a collaborative project means uh, you're working on something, three to eight companies, a couple of universities, and you commercialize that idea within a two-year period. And at the moment, Meta can fund proof of concept hubs which is subjects or proof of concept projects, up to half a million dollars. One of the ways to connect these networks, we have four levels of uh, connection here. One level is the, the most powerful one, the local community networks. And the way we engage with the local community, we set up partnership agreements. I mean, I was uh, a couple of days ago at HunterNet, a fantastic network, um, and I've seen many around Australia. And Meta has a partnership with these networks and all we want is the manufacturing businesses in that network because they're trusted networks, they've operated for a long time, they might have councils, service providers, everything in these networks and they do exist in Australia. Meta aims to connect these networks, the manufacturing companies that are there, get them engaged because the most active members work on activities, it's industry led industry helping industry, supporting one another. And that's the beauty of it. It's not a top-down approach where camera tells you to do this, it's bottom-up. It's industry taking the baton and saying, I want to do this, That's the, and I want to take responsibility and not listen to anyone else telling me what to do. And that's the first level, which is the local community network. The second level, technology and process. We have um, uh, certain technologies, uh, Last week, I was at Deakin University and Meta launched the Meta Carbon Fiber Hub, which is in Geelong, so it's a precinct where they want to set up the future industry on Carbon Fiber Hub. Uh, and this is talking about creating a cluster between industry, Deakin being the university, and all of the suppliers you need and the applications for Carbon Fiber Hub. And, and Meta basically uh, um, open the first uh, collaboration hub and VCAM, the organization, is running this hub and out of this hub they can generate projects, they get companies, we have 10 or 12 companies that are in the carbon space, so it's growing that network nationally and getting others involved. The level three, which is the application level, uh, I think Craig will talk to you uh, on the sports technology. So sports is a big thing in Australia. We are the best in the world. We have very good uh, a national sporting organization, we have the Australian Institute of Sport, uh, sport, and the sports technology hub that we will start, it's about bringing the manufacturers, bringing researchers together, and being globally competitive in all of these uh, sport widgets uh, that measure athlete, 
at the lyrics uh, and performance of athletes. Yeah? So it's that. And the last one, industry. So we have lots of industries. And I often ask people, what, where, what is the competitive advantage of Australia? Where should we play in? I mean, I uh, always use the example of what is the difference between Germany and Australia. Germany has uh, no resources. Australia has resources. But do we use our resources to our advantage? No. So it's an equal playing field. Uh, the, the, the cost between Germany and Australia is the same in terms of uh, uh, labour. But we, we don't take an advantage. If you see the discussion on gas, if you see what we do with resources and not adding value, we're not creating a natural advantage. <coughs> and often people come up with two things that we should compete in, food and defence. And I say, instead of looking a sector and trying to say, well, this is what Australia should, you know, what is Australia good at? We should look at within these industry sectors, what are our core capabilities, our core competencies, and compete in these areas because it's not competing New South Wales against Victoria, it's competing on a global scale. That's what the, that's the globalised world. Richard, I'm nearly finished. So, the activities of META is really, I can sum them up into three things. It's, uh, it's creating this collaboration network of industry and universities in a database with a capability mapping. It's collaborative activities through projects and collaboration hubs all around Australia, so it's not specific, and connecting those networks along four levels, which is the local community level, and I know that there are, I've looked at the list here, people from RDA, from HunterNet, uh, from everywhere. So it's connecting these networks and the other one is around international benchmarking. So international best practice is a very important element. What we intend to do here is really bring the best practice. So why does it cost $30 per kilo, kilowatt hour, the wholesale price of the electricity for manufacturers in Australia compared to seven US dollars in, 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 uh, in the US? So what are the what are the differences? Because often people talk about, yeah, it's not a level playing field, the Australian dollar's high, but uh, the labour costs are too high. We know all of these things, but we want to talk the real things. And when I talk to the SMEs, when I've been with, uh, around Australia, uh, a lot of the uh, issues that they bring up is really how do we, how can we play on the global stage? How can we be globally? And there you need a framework around red tape regulation, etc. So, MIDA has a strong national network of industry and universities, and this is only a snapshot. We have more than 300 uh, members and not paying members. They're there because they want, they're driving it. And this network <coughs> will determine, like no other, the future of uh, uh, global competitors of the Australian industry. And you see a lot of companies there, and one of the thing is, to give the smaller companies, the SME, a voice. And that's what META intends to do. But META is not about me. It's not about the Australian government funding META. Yes, we have that funding arrangement. It's more than a million euro. Um, and it can only be successful if people come on the journey, come on board, and engage through hubs and projects. Thank you very much. Thank you, Zoran. Um, I think I'd ask um, Barry to come up and then we'll have a question time for both speakers. So, Barry McGoggin from FIAL, which is the Food Industry Association. Good morning, everyone. I know I stand between you and legal stimulants, so I will try and keep it brief. Uh, I'd also like to start by poorly telling you a very bad joke. There was a number of people at a convention, and while they were sitting in the room waiting for their legal stimulants, the lights went out. And somebody at the front raised their hand. Somebody in the seat next to them raised their hand. After a few minutes, most people in the room had their hands raised, but somebody had had the sense to call the building supervisor, who happened to bring an electrician with him. When he came into the room, he said, why have you all got your hands raised? And somebody said, Many hands make light work. <laughs> there is, I told you it was a bad joke and it was told poorly. I did warn you up front. There is a reason for that. 
and uh, hopefully that will be made clear as I go through. So I want to talk about uh, the food and beverage industry, just a very quick snapshot. What we're doing about industry engagement, some live examples that Fial is uh, engaged with, and it's Fial as in Tajay, just to help you. Um, and some lessons that we've learned along the way. And I've been very pleased to hear from the speakers before me about some of the things that we are learning and putting in place, uh, what seems to be good practice. We just haven't been at it for very long. So the Australian food and beverage manufacturing industry. It's the largest single manufacturing industry within Australia with 23.5% of manufacturing for Australia. <coughs> $24 billion in 2003, 200,000 plus employees, excluding what is involved in agriculture, particularly in this case, uh, at farm, creating uh, packed mangoes and bananas and those sort of things. But there's uh, more than 13,000 manufacturers. Most of those are SMEs, as uh, is the case that Zoran was talking about with the manufacturing group. There's a high churn. There was a lot of people came into the industry just in food. We're not talking about beverage in this case. There's uh, as much churn in beverage, uh, but there's a lot of churn in the food and beverage manufacturing. But we have a government objective to increase our overall production significantly by 2015. So there's a lot of things, a lot of scope for growth. It's complex. It's not a surprise for you guys to, to know that it's complex. We have federal bureaus, we have state politics, we have industry associations, we have manufacturers, SMEs, multinationals, networks. And I agree with Zoran, I've never met an, a, a country with as many associations as there are in Australia. I think I found a website with 2,500 food and manuf beverage manufacturing associations. That's an awful lot of associations just for one sector. That's just, that's none of that. That's ridiculous. You can't keep up with it. That, with all of that going on, there's a lot of dynamics that are shaping our industry. There's a wealth of intellectual cap capability and resources that we have that we can tap into, and we can do a much better job. It's not being fully utilised. <coughs> Other speakers have mentioned that before. Collaboration is key to bringing the, our geographically dispersed country together and being able to do a better job with manufacturing in the food and beverage industry. There is changing quickly consumer drivers, desires and needs and we've got to be able to keep up with that. There's a focus at the moment on innovation, I'm sorry, on incremental <coughs> change rather than real innovation and many companies have substituted productivity change which in itself is a type of innovation and put aside what is going to be the way we behave differently. They're trying to use the same footprint they've got now, the same way of doing, just taking the edges off the margins and believing that that will get them to a sustainable future. That's not going to be the way that you'll maintain a sustainable future. It's great for the short term but doesn't give you the opportunity that you need to survive for the future. There's a disconnection and a lack of cooperation between researchers, educational institutes and other service providers across Australia and we are looking to address some of that. So Fial, what is it that we do? And hopefully, yes. Where we, like Meta, are industry led. All of the things that we are doing and engaging in have come from us going to industry and saying what is it that you need what is it that you want that you're not getting now? And what can Fial do to connect you all the way through the value chain? And in fact, it's probably not a value chain anymore. It's a value network. You can't just look up and down one way. You've got to look across. Who's doing what is outside your current immediate connection that you need to bring in to gain value? So Fial is looking to work right across the there's researchers, technology, innovation, uh, industry, and importers, suppliers, all across the value network to make a difference. To do that though, we have to change culture. That's not easy to do. And Zoran has talked about changing culture. I feel has talked about changing culture. We've got to do things differently. We've got to be communicative and sharing. Most, a lot of companies, because they're small, wrap their arms around what they know and do well and try and keep the world at bay. That's great and you can do that well, but if you want to succeed long term, you need other partners that you can trust and share with or you will stay, likely stay, small. You've got to be consultative. Who out there has got information you don't know but you need in order to benefit and to grow? 
You've got to be outcomes focused. Just saying today is what I can do and not looking at how you can improve, what you're going to change and how you're going to have a different output. You're going to get to exactly the same result tomorrow as you've got today. And if we want to change and be different, be able to engage with our retailers, be able to engage offshore, but we've got to be able to do, have outcomes that are different to today. It also means we have to be accountable for our actions. It's not the government that is at fault. It's not some state agency at fault. It's not geographic dispersion at fault. It's us who make and do that are the ones that have to take accountability for our, our actions. And if we are going to make a difference, we are the ones that have got to change, embrace a different way of doing things. But that's going to hurt because it means you've actually got to tell somebody what you're not good at or actually tell somebody what you are good at to invite them on the journey with you. And being open and transparent is not usually the way we do business, but it's important if we're going to make a difference. And then once you've been open, engaging, communicative, you've got to encourage other people on the journey because they're the ones that are likely to be your partners on the journey. And if you simply just tell people what you're doing, that's great, that's news. But encouraging others brings partners that makes a collaboration that makes a difference for the future. So it's time to share. Uh, FIAL is doing that by working both nationally and internationally. Uh, I like these two quotes. Um, the entrepreneur and inventors are no smarter, more courageous, tenacious and rebellious than the rest of us. They're simply better connected. And key business leaders can increase profitability through increasing connections, but increased production productivity maximizes and then declines as you increase your connections. So there is value in joining together, but you can get so connected, you're actually so busy joining the connections, you don't actually get anything done. So there is a natural limit we all will have based on our capability, based on our expertise, and based on who we bring on the journey with us, that will make a difference to what size cluster, what size engagement you can actually have. Um, I just want to highlight the actual goals that we want that in terms of the change in behaviour. We want to have the food and beverage industry to have a system and an approach for innovation that is successful for both today and tomorrow. We want the food and beverage industry to have a capability and capacity, and that's of not just technology and equipment, but people skills, because it's the people in the end that use the capability and the knowledge to make a difference. And we've got to have a new way of thinking. Without those three things together, we won't be able to make the changes that we're talking about for the food and beverage industry. So what have we done today? Um, a bit like Meta, we are looking at creating some hubs, some places where people can <coughs> come and put in opportunities where they can share and collaborate together. Uh, with our university partners and CSIRO, we have started what we call the SME Solutions Centre, where SMEs can come along and, with co-funding, provide a question <coughs> that they don't have the capabilities or technology in-house to solve, but need partnerships and people to collaborate with them on in order to solve and get to market. It, we've discovered that one size doesn't fit all um, and that geography isn't a necessarily a limiter. We're looking at 10 companies at the moment uh, and we have from um, Cairns all the way through to Hobart, different groups um, that are working, looking to collaborate. Sometimes it's just one company at the moment that is looking to find partners that will join them on the journey. But we have people who, uh, in one case, are fruit manufacturers. There is 10 guys in one spot that currently are dumping a third of their crop. That's going into the soil, it turns acidic, and that soil then can't be used for any future agriculture for quite a number of years. They've decided they need to solve how they can use what they're dumping and not put it in the ground. They've come together and said, we want to form a collaborative group in this location, which happens to be North Queensland, so that we can solve this for our region. But, come, but they've had a champion, and I'll talk about that in a second. We've got people that have got horticultural crops that are emerging and needing other partners <coughs> to support them in the emerging uh, horticulture. We've got people that are inventing new technologies around particle manufacture. How do they find others to come on the journey with them rather than just working together? What we have found is that by having a range of universities and skill sets, 
we've been able to invite more people into the opportunity than having just one partner. And the universities and CSIRO have agreed that they will work with us on who's the best person with the right skill sets, rather than fighting amongst themselves as to which of the, are they going to get the money or not. That's an example of uh, an emerging um, crop. It's called finger lime. Instead of having uh, little segments like you get in most of the citrus, it comes like, um, like a finger. When you open it out and you squeeze, you get these little pearls like caviar. And each of those little pearls, when you bite into it, has a burst of vinegar. And this company uh, is now uh, exporting into Asia because of the support that they've had. And the, the crop is now being able to be managed much more effectively because they've been able to find partners to help them get across a growing season where there was limitations. We also um, have run and are running what we call <coughs> collaborative rings where it's a peer learning format. Companies come together and share with other companies about issues that they've got. So we had one in Sydney uh, last week on packaging where I had a number of companies come in who said, who agreed that they would share a question and an issue that they had on packaging that they couldn't solve, but wanted help to know where the solution was. Other companies that were part of that collaborative ring, when they came in, came in with the expectation that they would share their insights, their connectivity, and their learnings with other people in the room to help them benefit their business. I talked before about encouragement. Those companies were encouraging each other I can do, I did this, you can too. Go and talk to these people and tell them I sent you. We've done this a number of times now, and what we're finding in one where that have been done a, sort of a month, six weeks ago, that the participants are now wanting to share together. We did one in Perth on some export uh, opportunities, and the people in Perth are now by themselves getting together to create their own cluster to support each other, to help each other across the line in getting their exports out the door and bringing more people in to share their knowledge and collaboration. This is not supplier to industry, this is industry to industry, so manufacturer to manufacturer. So it's not people selling things, it's people saying, I found a solution, I want to give you a solution that worked for me. We're also doing something called a, an innovation catalyst program, which we uh, have launched in the last month and we are uh, uh, doing a launch in New Zealand uh, next month on. This is where we're going to, we want to have uh, clusters in each state, ideally two, but we'll start with one in each state. And we are going to sponsor individuals in companies that will be champions for innovation and champions for managing and working together as a cluster. So they'll be geographically based, where we will have people that will come for training on what is it that you need to do to think differently, how do you behave differently, and as I mentioned, what are the skills you need in order to be able to be a cluster manager? How do you bring that talent and manage that together? So that will be done over a six month period as the people who put their hand up uh, to participate in that will get training on how to actually be a cluster innovator and leader in your company, but also in your region. Uh, we're going to ask for equal funding from industry, but we're going to see that because we know that we need to change the way that people do business. We're working with a, a company in Tasmania on an allergen calculator called Vital. This exists now <coughs> as, a web, uh, sorry, as a, an Excel spreadsheet, but we've got a, an international partnership that we have formed where there is uh, some guys in Holland that have been working together on allergen management in Holland. They know it works well and they want to partner with people in Australia to, to find a way to better manage, manage allergen assessment in Australia. So we're helping fund the startup of a web-based vital calculator that will have local support in each of the states <coughs> to be able to roll this out and give companies in each of the state a better opportunity to manage how you work out how much allergen there is in your product in order to manage your on-pack food claims. It's a real question across the food industry. Do I have an allergen? Do I not have an allergen? Do I put a, a, an on-pack claim or not? Uh, what do I do? I've got about two slides. So, what have we learned? There are multiple solutions. You can't just have one solution in order to have a successful cluster and successful networking. New adventures always have strange bedfellows and always need somebody that is a champion in order to make them successful. 
they've got to start with positive intent. Disbelieving and mistrusting each other is a recipe for disaster. But starting out with a positive attitude and believing in each other makes for success. And while everybody doesn't bring equal capacity and capability, everybody does bring something of value to the group. And each group needs to value the individuals within each of the group. And where we've started with those processes, we're seeing success. So what are we going to do next? We're going to form more broader, and we're looking to do some virtual clusters, particularly uh, with some of the ideas that we've got from the Vital Network. Uh, we're practitioners on a topic that we're going to try and connect them together for um, support. We're going to continue to use the collaborative rings. We're going to roll out the um, Catalyst program nationally and then take that to New Zealand. And we're looking for new opportunities right across the country in food and beverage, where there is a champion and where there is local capability that we can tap into and use, as Zoran has said, the incredible capability that exists out there that people don't know about to make a difference in the local community and the local manufacturing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Barry. And I'll open up this session with Barry and Zoran for questions. So, do we have any questions? At the back? Yes, thank you very much, Barry. Uh, Tracy Scott Richards. I'd actually like to just suggest that what we've had here today, I think there are 70 or 80 folks from around the country who are natural born, perhaps collaborators and connectors, representing their regions and economic development. And I just wonder if the uh, opportunities here, right here and now, to be proactive and, and share with you, uh, you know, link you to the companies in their regions if that's appropriate, be it in manufacturing or in food. So I just wanted to raise that with the, the floor today. Um, I see a perfect opportunity for us to connect right here and now and uh, to be feed in to your issues. Um, in addition, we've got Rob Brown and Richard Walker with extensive databases to all food clusters and manufacturing clusters in Australia. They may be able to help populate their databases. Thanks. Any other question? Uh, look, from our point of view, um, there is, sorry, and I have said, there is thousands of companies and thousands of associations in Australia. We cannot possibly get to all of them but we would like to help as many companies as possible. So the more connectivity that you can help us with, the more companies are likely to benefit. And so any assistance that you can give us in taking what we are doing or giving us opportunities to help you in what you're doing, that's exactly what we've been designed and set up to do. So any connectivity that you can help with us would be fabulous. Yes. Oh, sorry. I just wanted to... Uh, thank you for your question, it's very good. Uh, the local community networks, definitely uh, in terms of what I said, this is the most powerful engagement to create networks or clusters. And as I mentioned, um, you know, RDAs, and uh, you'd be amazed at every state how many different networks and how much overlap there is. And uh, because uh, Meta is manufacturing, advanced manufacturing, all I'm looking at is to set up a collaborative partnership uh, in a formal arrangement to get all of the manufacturers that are in that network, because it's trusted, do what you're doing, but uh, get them involved in collaboration projects, collaboration hubs with clear, tangible outcomes. And we've seen that with Carbon Fiber, the Sports Technology Hub. Uh, you know, if you approach me during the break, I can give you more details about how to engage with Meta. But it's a local community network, and the, I've seen the organisations that are here today. Uh, we can find the way, uh, and in my case, it's you know having manufacturers uh, in that network. Um, there's a person, yes. Uh, I think it's Janelle no Boynton from an RDA community member in Victoria. Um, just on the last two speakers and either before, I just wonder if there's been any work on profiling what those change leaders are. I have a theory about um, who they are in our communities and often they're key industry but private business um, leaders that lead change in regions. And I think with our, I call it the tall poppy harvester now, um, 
there's a real issue about um, time pressures on private, I own a private business as well, time pressures on private business to also hold that leadership and not um, affect your day-to-day -day business and image in your community. And I actually think that, you know, you're about to do a, you know, be a change agent in the food cluster and I've, I've been that myself and I think my, I'd like to see some work around supporting um, some profiling of what those leaders look like and what they'll look like in the future. Right. Um, it's an interesting uh, leadership, and I sort of mentioned in my presentation, and I mentioned the Meta 500, the hidden champion companies. I've talked to more than 400 of these leaders. The leadership mindset of a successful company is really what I said before. It's this can-do attitude, challenging the status quo, seeing as a future, tackling the world globally. And they don't need government to do their business. Um, and the reason I said about the Meta 500 is finding the 500 companies, and I'm not talking here about the multinationals, the SMEs, that are already successful. All they need is a voice, and they will show the others what is possible. And as far as, you know, I often hear people, um, you know, we get a great speaker and talks about leadership, and there are good leaders and bad leaders all around the world. Uh, you know, and uh, what we're trying to do actually is instill this uh, culture of showing through good leadership what is possible. And, and some of the companies, it's not just about the lead, I mean, it, it has a lot to do with the guy at the top, but when you walk into the uh, uh, company themselves, you can sense the culture, how engaged the employees are, how they form a part of the success of that whole company. And of course, it's that leadership culture uh, that comes about. So that's, that's very good. It's a very good question. We ourselves haven't done any formal review of what type of capabilities and skills to identify anybody in particular, uh, but that would be a very useful thing to do. We've got all sorts of people from farmers through to uh, factory shop workers who own their own business that must have a similar sort of thought process and approach because they are the ones that are making the difference as influencers. How they influence is very different and that I would be interested if I thought you've got anything about how people tease out that influential capability to bring people together that we could all use to identify who are the champions. Zoran's gone and visited 400 people. Um, I'd be very tired at the end of that, I think, if I was to do that. If there's a way we can do that smarter and faster, I'd love to be able to, to find that, that key for us to help identify faster so that we can get things done there. Well, thank you very much, uh, both Zoran and uh, Barry, and thank you for your uh, productive, uh, interesting insights into manufacturing.